So what next? Prove it. Prove with a single equation that time had a beginning. Wouldn't that be nice, Professor? The one simple, elegant equation to explain everything. Yes, it would. It would indeed. Welcome back, Neurophiles. Dr. Ribbonick here. Yes, it would be truly amazing if we had one theory to explain all myelopathies. But unfortunately, we are really far from that. Let's rise to the challenge anyway and try to understand spinal disorders. Unfortunately, the material is dense and the talk is long. But if you make it all the way out to the end, there is a very nice present waiting for you in the form of a condensed treatment algorithm. I have no relevant disclosures. So objectives for this talk are to review six common chief complaints suspicious for myelopathy, to review spinal cord anatomy, uh, mainly six common patterns of cord lesions, and to differentiate between extramedullary, that is outside the cord, and intramedullary, inside the cord lesions, to learn to differentiate seven major pathological categories, to discuss five neurodiagnostic tools, and we'll conclude with a brief overview of available treatments. So, let's start with a case. We have a 40-year-old woman, previously healthy, who over the past three days developed progressive weakness in all extremities, starting with the right arm, and associated back pain which she described as electricity shooting down her spine, which, by the way, improved with flexion. She also complained of paresthesias in upper extremities, pins and needles. She denied bowel, bladder difficulties, along with febrile illness, unintentional weight loss, illicit drug use, joint pains, rashes, photosensitivity, recent travel, trauma, or family history of neurological disorders. She works as a secretary, so needless to say, she has no relevant occupational exposure. On the initial evaluation in the emergency department, her vital signs are normal, and she's able to protect her airway. Mental status and cranial nerve exams are normal. There's significant flaccid, meaning low tone, weakness in all four extremities with some anti-gravity effort in both arms, but a good effort against resistance in both legs. So legs are better than the arms. There's significant sensory loss below the clavicle to all modalities, much more pronounced than the arms, and reflexes are preserved. She's still able to walk, but she needs assistance. So this is a myelopathy talk, so spoiler alert, the patient will turn out to have a myelopathy. So what is it about this case that has you thinking of a spinal cord lesion? Let's enter that question by reviewing the typical chief complaints in patients with myelopathy. So depending on the actual pathology, Back pain may be the earliest and most prominent symptom. With spinal cord lesions, especially when the cord is swollen or compressed, back pain gets worse when the body extends because that decreases the diameter of the spinal canal and worsens compression. A person feels better when flexed when the spinal cord has extra room in the spinal canal. So compare that to back pain because of a compressed nerve root Common radiculopathy, for example, where nerve root is compressed in the intervertebral foramina by inflammatory changes which are associated with a herniated disc, for example. So those patients prefer to stay extended. They prefer to lie down flat because flexion actually reduces the size of the intervertebral foramina, making nerve root compression worse and making the pain worse. So myelopathic pain gets better with flexion. Radiculopathic pain gets worse with flexion. Weakness is common, and the extent of arm-leg involvement depends on the level of the cord lesion. Unsteady gait can be caused by weakness, disturbed position sense, or damage to descending cerebellar pathways. A person with a spinal cord lesion may develop pain and cramping in the calves after walking even short distances. This phenomenon is called neurogenic claudication, usually gets better with rest. Bowel bladder dysfunction happens with damage to descending pathways or sacral fibers. 
Sensory level is the most specific complaint and, of course, most helpful in localization. So patients describe this sensitive squeezing belt with numbness and tingling below that level. Unfortunately, sensory complaints are rarely presented to you so neatly. You would have to work for it. So a good question to ask is, if the water temperature feels the same throughout the body when standing in a warm shower. Hey, where are you going? Oh, man, I can't feel my toes. I don't have any toes. I think I need a hug. Well, thankfully, our patient read the proverbial book, so her complaints point to a cord lesion. But in order to be certain, we do have to review some cord anatomy to understand what's actually damaged. So let's put those first two years of med school to good use. Well, here's a slice of the cervical cord in all of its glory. Pretend that the patient's lying down in front of you, feet first, ventral part is towards the top, and dorsal side is towards the bottom of the slide. This is, by the way, the same orientation of the cord that you would see on the MRIs, so I didn't choose this view by accident. Dorsal columns, spinocerebellar tracts, and anterolateral system, or you may know it by another name, spinothalamic tract, are the ascending or sensory pathways. There's a whole slew of so-called extrapyramidal motor tracts in the spinal cord, including anterior corticospinal, tectospinal, vestibular spinal, reticulospinal, and rubrospinal. They're important in neurological recovery after lesions, but their clinical significance is way overshadowed by the dominant lateral corticospinal tract. In general, medial descending motor systems help control axial muscles, posture, balance, and head movements, and evolve to essentially automate walking. Pyramidal system, on the other hand, develop to finely tune more complex movements using the hands and feet. If you're walking with your face glued to your mobile phone, the medial systems will make sure you don't fall, while the pyramidal track will allow you to tap stuff on the screen. So the three clinically important tracks you need to remember are the dorsal column lumniscal pathway, it's located in the medial dorsal cord and serves vibration proprioception fine touch, like most pathways, it has a spatial map. Legs are represented most medially and neck most laterally. The second pathway you need to remember is the spinothalamic tract, which is also known as the anterolateral system, well, because it's anterior and lateral in the spinal cord. And it serves pain, temperature, and crude touch. Remember, as the tract ascends, leg fibers come into the cord first cross over, and then get pushed to the outside by the trunk and arm fibers that come in later. So legs are lateral and arms are medial. And finally, the lateral corticospinal tract or pyramidal tract. It's located posterior laterally, and the legs are represented laterally just like in the spinothalamic tract. Let's take a look at what happens when the entire cord is damaged in a transverse fashion. As we mentioned, the most specific finding is a sensory level, and it typically affects all modalities. Sensory fibers enter the posterior cord, ascend one to two levels, and then decussate in the anterior commissure. So the sensory level is typically present one to two segments below the actual lesion. Bilateral weakness is usually a given. It's worth noting that acute cord injury typically causes spinal shock and paralysis, with low tone and decreased reflexes, almost like in lower motor neuron lesions. Over days to weeks, spasticity then develops and the reflexes become hyper. If descending micturition pathways are affected, then patients can develop urinary dysfunction. Damage to the sympathetic pathways traveling in the intermedial lateral column can cause serious dysautonomia. And if that's not bad enough, Phrenic nerve can be affected in cervical lesions, causing paralysis of the diaphragm, which basically means intubation and artificial ventilation. Finally, damage to the anterior cord cells at each segment can cause lower motor neuron pattern of weakness in the muscles innervated by that segment. But with all the severe upper motor neuron deficits going on, you won't usually be able to detect anterior horn symptoms at the bedside. So, what's a prototypical disease that can cause this type of lesion? Starts with a T and ends with transverse myelitis. That's right, transverse myelitis, inflammation or infection of the cord. We'll talk about specific causes of various cord lesion patterns in a bit. 
What if half a chord is damaged instead of the whole chord? You may know this lesion as brown sequard. Ipsilaterally, a patient will lose power and vibration proprioception sensation below the level of the lesion. Those two tracks have already crossed over. Pain and temperature deficits will be contralateral and about one to two levels below the actual lesion, since the damage is catching spinothalamic tract fibers coming from the opposite side that have already crossed over in the anterior commissure. The lesion may also catch some sensory fibers on the same side before they get a chance to cross over, and the patients may have a small area of ipsilateral deficit at the level of injury. Let's not forget the descending sympathetic fibers. Disruption can cause dysautonomia on the same side. One side of the body stops sweating, for example. How weird is that? So what's missing from this list? Where's bladder dysfunction? Well, bladder dysfunction does not happen because this requires bilateral damage to descending autonomic pathways. By the way, brown sequard does not have to be caused by trauma, and almost anything that can involve the entire cord can also cause a hemicord pathology, including multiple sclerosis and varicella zoster virus myelitis. Dorsal lesions are simple to understand. Dorsal cord includes the dorsal column pathway, so vibration, proprioception, and sensation is decreased. Patients develop a kind of a sensory ataxia with a stomping gait. Have you ever rushed down the stairs and your foot missed a step and landed a step lower than you expected? Well, then you've stomped. Patients with absent proprioception cannot tell the position of their limbs accurately and stomp constantly. There are several diseases that can cause a dorsal lateral syndrome. This is when dorsal columns and lateral corticospinal tracts are damaged together and patients develop a motor neuron pattern of weakness. Vitamin B12 deficiency is the poster child for this type of damage, causing a disease named subacute combined degeneration of the cord. What signs would you get if only the anterior cord is damaged? Well, everything but vibration and proprioception will be dysfunctional. That means upper motor neuron pattern of weakness, bladder dysfunction, and pain and temperature deficits below the level of the lesion, just like in a complete transverse cord lesion. Unfortunately, anterior horn cells may be damaged too, causing those pesky segmental signs with low motor neuron weakness. Think paralysis of the diaphragm and the upper cervical cord is involved. So just like with transverse lesions, uh, those patients often need to be intubated. Can you think of a disease that causes this pattern of damage? If you said anterior spinal artery infarction, you're correct. If you didn't, don't feel bad. Hopefully it will roll off your tongue by the end of this talk. Certain diseases have a preference for anterior horn cells. So lesions would cause low motor neuron signs, as expected, and of course, sensation will be preserved. Poliomyelitis, for example, is the prototypical disease. Can you believe polio is still around? West Nile myelitis is another perfect example. Central cord syndrome. So a small lesion disrupts the crossing of spinothalamic fibers in the anterior commissures and causes a loss of pain and temperature sensation in a few dermatomes on both sides at the level of the lesion. It's a so-called suspended sensory level. This lesion keeps you in suspense. Sensation is normal above and below the lesion because the spinothalamic tracts themselves are spared. Because lower cervical and upper thoracic cord is usually affected, the sensory loss is in a cape or vest-like distribution. Dorsal columns are not affected, so there is sensory dissociation where pain and temperature are impaired and vibration proprioception are spared. Syringomyelia, hyperextension injury of the neck, and intramedullary cord tumors can cause this pattern of deficits. By the way, uh, with all the crazy stunts he pulls and all of his neck hyperextension injuries, there's no way that Batman doesn't have a central cord syndrome. He probably uses his cape to cover up his cape-like distribution of sensory loss. As a central lesion enlarges, it begins to involve corticospinal tracts and the anterior horn. So the clinical picture becomes suspiciously similar to that of a transverse cord lesion with upper motor neuron type weakness, segmental signs, and diffuse sensory loss to all modalities. But there are two important differences. What do you think they are? Well, first, the arms are affected early in central cord lesions, 
because of their medial representation in the corticospinal tract and the anterior horn. And second, sacral fibers are on the outside of the cord and are usually spared. This means no sacral sensory loss or bladder dysfunction until very late in the disease. Now that we understand the central cord syndrome, and this is the perfect time to review yet another localization differentiator, that is extramedullary, or cord compression from the outside, versus intramedullary, or lesions in the center of the cord. Let's compare these lesions with respect to presence of pain, sensory, and motor symptoms. Compressive lesions of the cord are painful early on. Remember when we talked about back pain getting better with flexion and worse with extension? Intramedullary cord lesions can also be painful, but it's usually a spinothalamic kind of pain, burning and poorly localized. When only one side of the cord is compressed, patients will have cross-sensory signs consistent with a hemicord lesion, meaning contralateral pain and temperature and ipsilateral vibration proprioception loss. But more often than not, compression ends up being bilateral. Cord is squeezed by the lesion on one side and against the spinal canal on the opposite side. Remember that legs are represented laterally in the spinothalamic tract, so sensory loss appears to ascend. Now let's compare that to a central cord lesion. With smaller lesions, there is sensory dissociation early on and vibration proprioception is spared along with the sacral fibers, which are anterolateral in the spinothalamic tract. So in a central cord lesion, sensory symptoms appear to descend, the total opposite of compression. Now onto motor deficits. So you remember that legs are represented laterally in the corticospinal tract. So they are affected early, even with the compression at the cervical level. So let's pause there for a second. If you have a lesion compressing the cervical spinal cord, legs will be affected first. And just like with any corticospinal tract damage, upper motor neuron signs like hyperflexia and spasticity are prominent. So this is the reason why whenever we suspect cord compression in a patient with weakness of both legs, we have to image the entire spine and not just lumbar and thoracic levels. With expanding central cord lesions, anterior horns are affected before corticospinal tracts and we see lower motor neuron signs. And finally, gait instability may be the only symptom in very early cord compression. Why? Because spinous cerebellar pathways are on the outside of the cord. Ooh, that was a lot of information. Take a breather. Well, hopefully this was a nice review, but we've strayed too far from our case. As a reminder, our patient had flaccid quadriparesis, significant sensory loss in both upper extremities, preserved reflexes, and preserved bladder function. The deficits are basically summarized on the right. So what's the localization of this patient's lesion? I'll give you a second to think about it. Here's our patient's spinal MRI. For now, we'll simply use this MRI to confirm our localization. Let me orient you. This image is the sagittal view of the cervical and upper thoracic spine. Patient is looking towards your left, and the slice is right through the middle of the cord. You can see the spinal column on the left, and vertebral bodies are conveniently labeled. Spinal canal is right behind the spinal column, and it's filled with CSF which looks bright white on this T2 image. The normal spinal cord where the arrow is pointing appears dark on T2 because it's predominantly white matter. All caught up? Now, let's look at the rest of the cord. Do you see a problem? Yeah, the center of the cord is hyper intense. 
Now let's take a look at T2 axial cuts. This time, the patient is lying down in front of you with their back facing the bottom of the slide. The first cut is at the level of C4, the next cut is at the level of C6, and the third image is a cartoon of the lesion. The vertebral body is labeled, and you can make out the spinal cord in the spinal canal surrounded by bright CSF. So, I hope by now you've figured out that our patient has a large central cord lesion. And now for the fun stuff. What's our patient's pathological differential diagnosis? She's a healthy 40-year-old woman with acute progressive myelopathy because of a large central cord lesion. And she denied febrile illness, unintentional weight loss, illicit drug use, joint pains, rashes, photosensitivity, recent travel, trauma, family history of neurological disorders, and any relevant occupational exposure. Do you have any ideas? Write them down and hold that thought. Now is the perfect time to review the broad pathological differential of myelopathy. Let's see if your differential comes out on top. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Welcome, Neo. Nice move on taking the red pill and following me down the rabbit hole. Myelopathies can essentially present acutely subacutely or chronically. In the acute subacute cases, we are typically worried about immune mediated infectious, and vascular causes. In the chronic camp, the usual suspects are hereditary, toxic metabolic, and neoplastic disorders. Structural disease refuses to pick a side and can present acutely, subacutely, or chronically. This is the reason why every time you present a myelopathy case, you might hear your attendings ask, was structural disease ruled out? Structural disease, structural disease, structural disease. Don't forget structural disease. Got it? I call this art piece the sideways myelopathy tree. If it catches on, I'll make t-shirts. Inflammation can be limited to the CNS or be a side effect of systemic inflammation. Diseases that affect CNS include multiple sclerosis, neuromyelitis optica, or NMO, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, or ADEM, and perineoplastic syndrome, a rare disorder triggered by deranged immune response to malignant cancer. Disorders that cause systemic inflammation include sarcoidosis or neurosarcoidosis, lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, and Bichette's disease. So how do we clinically suspect immune-mediated diseases? Well, there are several clues. These pathologies usually present early, within days to weeks, just like with any cord lesion, symptoms really depend on the tracks involved. Lermit phenomenon uh, refers to an electric shock-like sensation in the limbs or down the spine provoked by neck flexion. Presumably this happens because of irritation of dorsal columns, and this is usually seen in MS. Just like conduction of electrical wires improves with cold and worsens with heat, Patients with MS report worsening neurological deficits with exertions or heat exposure. This is called Utoff phenomena. Think of MS patient getting worse after a hot bath. History of prior attacks is helpful in the diagnosis of CNS inflammation. You may remember that the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis depends on dissemination of lesions in space and time. Finally, don't forget to ask patients with myelopathy about systemic symptoms. For lupus, think of photosensitivity, rashes, joint pains, renal disease, 
Sjogren's affects salivary glands and causes dry eyes and dry mouth. Neurosarcoidosis is a great mimicker and can cause granulomatous disease of the lungs, so ask about pulmonary symptoms. By the way, pathologically, sarcoidosis looks suspiciously like tuberculosis infection, and some people even postulate that sarcoidosis is an immune response to mycobacterial infection gone wild. Bichette's is one of those medical zebras. It's basically a rare immune-mediated systemic vasculitis, inflammation of vessels of any size, typically in people with Middle Eastern descent, that causes mouth and genital sores, ulceration of gastrointestinal tracts, and arthritis, among other things. Now, let's talk about the radiographic features. Localization is important for CNS inflammation. Centrally located lesions in the cord tend to be caused by NMO and neurosarcoidosis. MS can involve the posterior cord. Specific tracts, such as dorsal or lateral columns, may be damaged by perineoplastic etiologies. The extent of the lesion is also important. We're talking about short segment or discrete lesions, less than one vertebral segment, and compare those to longitudinally extensive lesions involving at least three or more vertebral segments. Finally, enhancement. Acute inflammation breaks the blood cord barrier and allows the contrast agent to leak into the inflamed parenchyma. So inflammatory lesions enhance, and enhancement can help you highlight regions of active disease. Let's take a look at some examples. Here, you're looking at a sagittal T2 MRI of the spine with a section roughly midway through the spinal cord. Can you see the problem? There's an extensive lesion involving the cervical cord and the medulla. Well, this is a typical longitudinal extensive lesion, and this patient has neuromyelitis optica. Now, how is this next image different? Well, the lesions are more discreet. This is an example of a patient with multiple sclerosis. This is a close-up of the spinal cord on axial T1 with gadolinium. Just to orient you again, the patient is supine here and facing the ceiling, and the vertebral and spinal canal are labeled. Notice the nodular subpeal enhancement. Kind of makes me think of thick slime, you know, those alien movies. While this is granulomatous inflammation, the hallmark of neurosarcoidosis. Neurosarcoid also involves the central canal, which you can see here. A few words about this great mimicker. It's a waxing and waning granulomatous process, and enhancement can last for decades, with patient looking clinically better than the MRI. One of the few diseases in neurology that actually does that. It is thought to be a deranged immune response to mycobacterial infection. Neurosarcoid usually spreads locally, unlike MS, which is more multifocal. Now, this next image is not spine. Yeah, I know, I'm a master of the obvious. This is an axial flare image, T2-based image with CSF subtracted so we can better see the lesions. Patient is looking up at the ceiling, and your left is the patient's right. You can probably make out the abnormalities from across the room. Large, confluent white matter lesions. This is a patient with acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis. ADEM patients are usually kids and teenagers, younger than your typical MS patients, and the illness has a monophasic clinical course. Patients don't relapse after treatment like they do in MS. Spinal lesions in ADEM look like MS plaques on MRI, so it's impossible to distinguish based on the spinal imaging alone. The moral of the story here is that getting MRI of the brain can be helpful in the diagnosis of myelitis. Sheldon, let's go! To a hospital? Full of sick people? Oh, I don't think so. Okay, well, your friend and his mother are there. We're going. Oh, don't tell me you're afraid of germs. Not all germs. Just the ones that will kill me. Let's talk about germs. We are essentially dealing with four groups of organisms. Bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites, but you already knew that. In the bacterial category, 
The usual suspects include Staph aureus, tuberculosis, Lyme, syphilis, and brucella. Viruses causing myelopathy are herpes viruses, like HSV2 and VZV, flaviviruses, like West Nile and Zika, enteroviruses, like Coxsackie and polio, and retroviruses, such as HIV and human T-cell lymphotrophic virus type 1, HTLV, which causes tropical spastic paraparesis. Tropical, because it's prevalent in equatorial regions, and spastic paraparesis refers to the virus's love for the motor tracts in the spinal cord. Coccidioides and cryptococcus are some example of cord-damaging fungi, and schistosoma and neurocysticercosis are playing for the parasite team. This is by no means an exhaustive list, and you can probably imagine that any bug that affects the CNS can also affect the spinal cord. So how do we clinically suspect an infectious cause? Well, time course for one. We talked about how most infections are acute to subacute. Think Lyme, herpes, polio. But as most things in medicine, there are exceptions. Tabes dorsalis, for example, a manifestation of tertiary syphilis, can occur decades after primary infection. TB and HTLV-1 infections can also cause a slowly progressive symptoms. Fevers are certainly seen in many infections, especially bacterial. But not every infection causes fever. For example, HTLV-1 and neurocysticercosis do not. I usually despise the kind of memorized pattern recognition that you are sometimes taught in med school, but since symptoms of different infections tend to be fairly nonspecific, host factors like immune status, geographical and occupational exposures become even more important in the diagnosis. So prepare for some ill-advised pattern recognition. If you visited the southwestern United States or San Joaquin Valley in California, then watch out for coccidioides. Neurocysticercosis larva lives in undercooked pork. Immunocompromised patients can get cryptococcus and cytomegalovirus infection. Brucellosis can be acquired from cattle and goats and on pasteurized dairy products. Presence of meningitis, infection of the meninges, and encephalitis, infection of the brain parenchyma, is also diagnostically helpful. Certain pathogens do not cause CNS disease until infection is disseminated. Aspergillosis is a good example, and it actually causes encephalitis. Neurocysticercosis also loves the brain much more than the spinal cord, and in fact it's a common cause of seizures worldwide. The clinical symptoms of meningitis and encephalitis you probably already know, and they're illustrated below. When it comes to imaging of infections, we are typically dealing with five patterns. Extramedullary compressive lesions, like spinal abscesses. Transverse myelitis, involving the entire cord segment, like in herpes simplex infections. Tract-specific involvement, meaning dorsal columns, corticospinal tracts, etc. We already mentioned syphilis for that one. Predilection for anterior horn, think polio, West Nile. And irregular mass-like lesions with parasitic infections. There are also variable levels of enhancement. Let's take a look at some images. Pyogenic organisms love to settle in the epidural space where there's abundant vascular supply, and this is where you'll find bacterial abscesses. Here is an example of a large thoracic epidural abscess posterior to the cord. It is hyperintense on a sagittal T2 and enhancing on a sagittal T1 with contrast. On an axial T2 image, there is compression of the cord. Here is a cartoon to help you understand this MRI. The arrow is pointing to accumulation of pus in the epidural space. TB and coccidiomycosis can also cause thick inflammatory exudates in the epidural space. It's probably fair to say that majority of infectious organisms cause some form of complete or partial transverse myelitis. Infectious transverse myelitis may be longitudinally extensive and unfortunately indistinguishable from immune-mediated myelitis that we discussed in the previous section. But sometimes we may get lucky and MRI can give us a clue regarding pathogenesis. Take a look at this example. 
On the sagittal T1 image of the cervical and thoracic spine with contrast, you see multiple posterior segmental enhancing lesions. The axial T1 with contrast shows enhancement of the nerve root and posterior horn. What infection loves to lie dormant in the dorsal root ganglion and reactivates along the nerve roots? Have you figured it out? Yeah, this is varicella zoster virus. Let's take a look at a different example. What do you see in this sagittal T2 image of the cervical spine? If you set hyperintensity in the anterior cord, you're correct. Anterior horn involvement is even more obvious on the axial T2 image. This is an example of anterior horn involvement, in this case by a West Nile virus. This is the fifth type of MRI lesion seen in infections. Here we have a sagittal T2 and a sagittal T1 with contrast, showing patchy, mass-like, multinodular enhancing intramedullary lesions of schistosomiasis. Here is the enhancement on the axial slice. Schistosomiasis is caused by a parasite most prevalent in contaminated waters in sub-Saharan Africa. Symptoms of acute infection are fairly nonspecific, but look for elevated eosinophils. Based on the progression of symptoms, the clot is growing. We need to cut into there appears to be clotting is like saying there's a traffic jam in my head. Is it a 10 car pileup or just a really slow bus in center lane? If it is a bus, is it a thrombotic bus or an embolic bus? I think I pushed that metaphor too far. So now that we covered immune mediated and infectious myelopathy, Let's switch gears to vascular causes. There are essentially two major vascular lesions of the cord, ischemia and hemorrhage. Clot formation depends on three basic components, disorder of the blood vessel wall, disorder of the heart, and disorder of the blood itself, the Virchow's triad. Cord strokes are no different. The most common cause of cord ischemia is compromised perfusion through aortic branches. It may come as a surprise, but aorta is kind of important. So if it's traumatized by surgery or dissection, a tear of the inner lining, or unable to perfuse the cord properly during severe hypotension, the cord may become damaged. The classical story is that a person wakes up from aortic aneurysm repair surgery unable to move their legs. Blood supply to the cord can be compromised because of blood vessel inflammation, vasculitis, or just simple atherosclerotic stenosis. Emboli are another common cause. Imagine a patient with endocarditis showering clots and bacteria all over the body. Finally, clotting disorders and hypercoagulable states in patients with advanced cancer, for example, can also cause clots. On the hemorrhagic side, one worrisome cause is cord compression by epidural hematoma. Who do you think gets that disease? Did you say people with spine trauma or people on anticoagulants? You're right. So if you see a person post-motor vehicle accident or on anticoagulants who develops acute rapidly progressive cord syndrome, think epidural hematoma. Epidural hematoma, epidural hematoma, epidural hematoma. Did I say epidural hematoma? Even more rare is a direct connection between an artery and a vein or arteriovenous malformation. When that vein is a venous sinus, that malformation is called dural AV fistula. With thin vascular walls, veins cannot withstand high pressure of arterial flow and can rupture. Also, venous hypertension means that veins can't drain blood properly, causing venous congestion in the cord and ultimately ischemic stroke. How do you suspect vascular cord compromise? Well, this etiology is hyperacute or acute, we remember that. Ischemia or hemorrhage is usually rapidly progressive and painful. There's one anterior spinal artery and two posterior ones, so anterior cord is most susceptible to damage. Imagine that aorta is dissected. Here's that torn vessel wall with true and false lumens. Compromised flow in the aorta compromises flow to the radicular branches that ultimately fail to feed the anterior spinal artery. And with damage, patients develop anterior cord syndrome. By the way, quick review from 10 slides ago. 
which symptoms are usually not seen in cord infarctions. That's right, dorsal columns are spared, so vibration proprioception is typically preserved. Respiratory failure and neurogenic shock can happen with any cord pathology, but more likely with vascular etiologies because of their rapidly progressive nature, especially if cervical cord is damaged where the phrenic nerve originates. Cord compression from epidural hematoma presents like any other cord compression. If the lesion is in the cervical cord, legs are affected first, and the weakness eventually ascends to involve the arms. From there, neurogenic shock, cardiac arrest, and an irreversible case of death. So I cannot stress this enough that you should remember this diagnosis. Epidural hematoma, epidural hematoma, epidural hematoma. With respect to radiographic findings, two things are very prominent. There's no enhancement, since cord ischemia typically does not break the blood cord barrier, and there's restricted diffusion. Diffusion weighted imaging, or DWI MRI, is the gold standard for the diagnosis of acute ischemia. DWI is more challenging in the cord than in the brain, but it can show ischemia of the anterior horn and surrounding tissues. With respect to imaging hematomas, as blood sits outside of the blood vessels and decomposes, the signal on T1 and T2 sequences of MRI changes. Without getting too technical, how bright or dark the lesion looks can give us a clue about the hematoma's age. Let's look at some examples. You should be professionals by now reading these spinal MRIs. The first image is a sagittal T2. Can you see the problem? There's a pencil-like hyperintensity in the anterior cervical cord, suggestive of cord edema. Here is an example of DWI from another patient, where area of ischemia lights up. Axial T2 image from the first patient shows that anterior cord is damaged. Doesn't the spinal cord look like a face of an owl? How about now? This is actually called the owl eyes sign, and the owl eyes are the area of anterior horn damage. Neuroradiologists have all the fun constantly coming up with awesome names for things. By the way, anterior horn damage is not necessarily unique to spinal cord stroke, and you just saw an image almost identical to this one, minus the positive DWI, in the infectious disease section. Do you remember the organism? West Nile virus. So, two helpful distinguishing points here. Stroke shows up on DWI, and is more acute, rapidly progressive, and painful than viral myelitis. Here is an example of those mixed extramedullary T2 signals seen in epidural hematoma. These are sagittal cuts at different levels from the same patient. Look at the jelly donut compressing the cord at multiple cervical levels. The hyperintense dough of the donut is subacute blood, and the dark jelly is acute blood. Sorry for officially ruining donuts for you. How's your back, Dad? Well, there's a dull ache, certainly. And overlaid on that is a club sandwich of pain. Only instead of bacon, there's agony. Marge, can I have a BLT? Let's move on to structural pathologies. We will be talking about two major entities, cervical spongulosis and syringomyelia. Osteoarthritis can cause remodeling of bone and growth of bony osteophytes. Ligaments stabilizing the spine can hypertrophy, discs can herniate. All of these constrict the spinal canal like bad roommates getting on the spinal cord's nerves. The cord needs space to breathe. Here's an illustration of a surgeon's view of the spine during decompression surgery. You can see the highlighted bulging disc pressing on the cord. Syringomyelia or syrinx, is an intramedullary lesion. Typically, the central canal of the spinal cord is a potential space, but it can become filled with CSF and essentially act like a mass, pressing on the internal structures of the cord. Here's an illustration. When did this happen? You probably said traumatic cord injury, but also don't forget Arnold Chiari malformations. That's when cerebellar tonsils protrude through the foramen magnum, causing partial obstruction of subarachnoid space and increasing CSF pressure around the cervical cord. Clinically, 
Structural changes are usually chronic. So this is a patient we would see in the outpatient clinic. But remember the original myelopathy diagram. These can certainly present acutely. History of trauma may be helpful in the diagnosis, but not necessary. Cervical spondylosis and syringomyelia are as different as night and day. What are the typical symptoms of cord compression? Back pain, gait impairment or spastic gait because legs are represented laterally in the descending corticospinal tract, neurogenic claudication, and bladder dysfunction. Think of an older patient with back pain, bent over posture, and incontinence who cannot walk long distance without pain and cramping in the legs. Syringomyelia is an intrinsic cord lesion. So what symptoms would you expect here? Sensory dissociation, especially in the arms, since the cervical cord is usually involved. Lower motor neuron signs, like atrophy of hand muscles if anterior horns are involved. And finally, bladder control is spared until the lesion is very large. Picture a patient burning herself while cooking because of chronic progressive sensory loss in the hands and arms, and also constantly dropping objects because of muscle weakness and wasting in the hands. That patient will have a normal gait and bladder control. Radiographic features are relatively straightforward. There's multilevel disease and narrowing of the spinal canal. Occasionally, the cord is swollen because of trauma from compression, and edema looks hyperintense on T2. In recent literature, an interesting sign emerged of a transverse band of enhancement in spondylosis patients. While that's confusing, I just spent half the talk telling you that enhancement is typically seen in inflammatory and infectious pathologies. And that's true. But enhancement simply means the breakdown of blood spinal cord barrier. And in the case of cord compression, that breakdown is focal at the site of the compression. Finally, in syringomyelia, you see the fluid-filled space in the center of the cord. Once again, sagittal MRIs through the center of the spinal cord with the patient looking to your left. The first image is T2, and the second is T1 with contrast. You can see the bulging disc and spinal canal stenosis with cord edema, or T2 hyperintensity, and that transverse band of enhancement we talked about. Here is a closer look on an axial contrast-enhanced T1 image. Okay, now you try reading this MRI. Hopefully you just said that these are sagittal T2 and T1 images through midline of the cervical and upper thoracic spinal cord, and hopefully the CSF-filled space in the center of that cord is pretty obvious. It's hyperintense on T2 and hypointense on T1. Here's what it looks like on an axial cut. Oh, I have a headache. It might be a tumor. It's not a tumor. It's not a tumor at all. Next up, tumors. The most common spinal tumors are, of course, metastasis. Lung, breast, prostate, kidney, and thyroid. Primary CNS tumors are far less common and are generally subdivided by their location with respect to the spinal cord. Meningioma an intradural extramedullary tumor, for example, is the most common primary spinal cord tumor in adults. In children, the most common spinal tumors are actually ependymomas and astrocytomas, which are intramedullary, inside the cord. Finally, in this disease category, let's not forget that myelopathy can also be caused by the treatment of said tumors. Chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and radiation therapy can unfortunately all damage the spinal cord. Clinical features are fairly straightforward. You've heard me say back pain a gazillion times now, especially in the setting of cord compression. Tumor-related back pain is a little different. It's not associated with activity or position, it's not improved by rest, and it does not respond to conservative treatment. It just gets progressively worse. Also, this pain worsens at night from distension of cord's venous plexus. Percussion tenderness of the spine is another bad sign. Finally, bony invasion can lead to pathological fractures and spinal instability. Otherwise, 
Just like with any other pathology, the symptoms really depend on the part of the cord that's involved. Obviously, we can't finish a neurooncology fellowship in two slides, so instead of memorizing features of individual tumors, let's just sort these by their location. Here's a cross section of the spine, vertebral body towards the top, spinal cord in the middle surrounded by dura, and dorsal root ganglion laterally. I overlap tumors in various spaces. Let's start from the outside in. First, extradural. Metastases are the most common here and almost always involve the vertebra. It turns out that the dura is a firm anatomical barrier which metastases typically don't breach. We just mentioned some of these mets. Lung, breast, prostate, thyroid, renal cell cancers. I would add lymphoma to that list as well. Next up, intradural extramedullary, the involvement of the dura itself. The poster child of dural-based tumors is meningioma. As I mentioned, it is the most common spinal tumor in adults and is typically slow-growing. Can you think of another example? I hope you just said schwannoma. Leptomeningeal metastatic disease usually happens in advanced stage cancer. The typical suspects that spread to the meninges are breast, lung, melanoma, and gastrointestinal cancers. Last but not least, intramedullary. METs are very rare in this compartment, and we're generally dealing with primary CNS tumors like astrocytoma or ependymoma. Final fact, please remember that neurofibromatosis patients have mutations in tumor suppressor genes, and if type 1 patients get intramedullary tumors, like ependymomas and astrocytomas, and type 2 get dural-based tumors, like meningiomas and schwannomas. Here are some imaging examples. This first image is a sagittal T2 of the cord, do you notice the nodular cervical cord mass with cystic component? That's a good example of an ependymoma. Next, we have two images from the same patient. The first is a T2, and the second is a T1 with contrast. You can see enhancing dural-based mass in the high thoracic spine compressing the cord. What did I say was the most common dural-based neoplasm? Yep, this is a meningioma. Here's another example. From left to right, we have an axial T2, sagittal T2, and sagittal T1 with contrast. I hope you spotted the giant parasagittal mass. This is a straightforward example of extradural metastatic disease. All right, take a deep breath. We're more than halfway done. With a Ah, damn it. Now that song is going to get stuck in my head for the rest of the day. Oh, you're back. Well, let's move on to the toxic metabolic pathologies. We have deficiencies. Think vitamin B12, copper, vitamin E, and more rarely folate. Drugs. Heroin comes to mind. Toxins. The ones to know are nitrous oxide. It actually irreversibly inactivates vitamin B12. Secondly, hepatic failure supposedly because of portosystemic shunting of blood that allows ammonia and other nitrogenous waste to bypass the liver and cause damage to the spinal cord. Thirdly, there are dietary toxins, certain poorly processed roots and peas. These are rare and geographically specific, so you just need to be aware that they exist. Finally, the bottom of this list is radiation exposure, such as during cancer treatment, and environmental factors like decompression illness in divers. The most common clinical presentation to recognize is subacute combined degeneration. Subacute refers to the time course, and combined means both dorsal columns and lateral corticospinal tract are affected. This pattern of damage can be caused by deficiencies of vitamin B12, copper, and vitamin E, heroin toxicity, 
and also nitrous oxide intoxication, which I mentioned inactivates B12. Remember that vitamin B12 and copper are important for the maintenance of the entire nervous system. So in addition to myelopathy, patients develop peripheral neuropathy and cognitive deficits. And here is an illustration of a patient with vitamin B12 deficiency. This is a person with impaired position sense causing unsteady gait, which gets worse in darkness and with eyes closed. When you remove vision input, the patient totally relies on impaired position sense. Vitamin E deficiency can also cause the generation of cerebellar pathways. All of these deficiencies and toxins cause a very similar picture. So what will you ask the patient to help you differentiate? I'll give you a second to think about it. Yeah, you need a history of exposure or malabsorption, such as in the case of gastric surgery. You really need to ask about exposure and malabsorption. Guess what the radiological signs would be in combined degeneration? Well, posterior and lateral columns are damaged. That's a no-brainer. Now, earlier in the talk, we called this tract-specific changes. Can you remember what other pathologies can cause tract-specific changes in the cord? Infectious myelopathies. Think syphilis. But, unlike infectious etiologies, there's usually no enhancement. Unfortunately, MRI can also be completely normal. So, focus on history for your diagnosis. Exposure, malabsorption. Exposure, malabsorption. What did I just say? Exposure, malabsorption. Here's an imaging example. Sagittal and axial T2s. Tract specific changes. In this case, dorsal columns are damaged. And here is an example where both dorsal columns and lateral columns are involved. The patient on the left has B12 deficiency. But, as we discussed, multiple other toxicities can have these same MRI findings. Push it as hard as you can. I am pushing as hard as I can. Wait. Wait, come on. One, two. Why won't it? Right, right. It's a progressive neurological disorder that destroys the cells in the brain that control essential muscle activity, such as speaking, walking, breathing, swallowing. The signals that muscles must receive in order to move are disrupted. The result is gradual muscle decay, wasting away. Eventually, the ability to control voluntary movement is lost entirely. I'm afraid average life expectancy is two years. There's nothing I can do for you. What about the brain? The brain isn't affected. Your thoughts won't change, it's just that well, eventually no one will know what they are. There's no doubt that hereditary myelopathies remain an uphill battle. And it's the toughest group to summarize, since there are different disorders caused by different mutations. The usual suspects are hereditary spastic paraplegias, or HSPs, various motor neuron disorders, and spastic ataxias, or spaxis. Here are some clinical pearls. These are chronic and slowly progressive. Age of onset is unfortunately broad, especially for HSPs, anywhere from infancy to seventh decade, so that's not really helpful. Motor and sensory signs usually affect the lower extremities, because the axonal damage is length-dependent. In HSP, there's a gradual and progressive spastic leg weakness, 
with variable degrees of dorsal column, autonomic, and bladder dysfunction. Family history and history of developmental delay can really help. For motor neuron disorders, anterior horn is usually affected and you will see a mixture of upper and lower motor neuron signs. Take a look at this patient who has difficulties with fine finger movements like buttoning buttons and has hand wasting and neck weakness. Neck muscles are typically very strong and neck weakness is a sign of a serious problem. Motor neuron disease deserves a dedicated talk so we'll leave it for now. Spinal cord degeneration can be a part of a larger neurodegenerative process, for example affecting cerebellar pathways. So diseases like spastic ataxia and spinocerebellar ataxias present with prominent cerebellar signs in addition to spasticity. Ultimately, to make the diagnosis of a hereditary myelopathy, you really need genetic and pathological confirmation. Congrats, you are now the master of spinal cord stuff. Let's get back to our case. To remind you, this is a relatively young, previously healthy woman with a large central cord lesion. There are no systemic symptoms, relevant occupational exposure, travel or family history. What's the pathological differential diagnosis in this case? You might have some ideas already, but let's think this through together. First, she has an acute myelopathy, so that generally makes us think of immune-mediated, infectious, vascular, and possibly structural etiologies. Let's consider immune-mediated. Is there any evidence of systemic inflammation? Joint pains, rashes, photosensitivity, kidney failure, connective tissue disorders? Not in this case. So we're left with inflammation limited to CNS. And what are the most likely diseases there? Well, multiple sclerosis and neuromyelitis optica. How about infectious? Well, there's no history of travel, exposure, or immunocompromised state, and there are no fevers. So infection is less likely. Vascular. Can this be a spinal cord stroke? Well, it's acute, it's painful, it's progressive. So far, so good. There are no traditional risk factors like aortic dissection or a hypercoagulable state, but these may be undiagnosed. You may remember that strokes typically cause anterior cord syndrome. We localize this patient's lesion to central cord, so inflammatory cause is still more likely. But strokes should stay on a differential. Finally, structural causes. Again, since we are concerned about a central cord process, the only structural etiology on our list is a syrinx. Other structural etiologies are typically compressive and will cause symptoms of extramedullary, not intramedullary lesion. Besides, structural pathology would have to be even less likely since there is no history of trauma and syringomyelia typically does not present in such a rapid fashion. So we are down to the three likely pathological differentials. But how do we confirm our final diagnosis? To answer that question, we need to spend a little time reviewing our diagnostic options. The first and most important diagnostic tool is still a detailed history and neurological exam. Earlier, I gave you several examples how many diseases can have the same imaging picture, but neuroimaging can still be helpful. The best initial test is the MRI of the spine with and without gadolinium. Neurological exam can narrow down the spinal cord levels, but we typically end up imaging the entire cord and sometimes the brain and the orbits, optic nerves to be precise. This is done to assess the full extent of CNS involvement. It's really useful to look at the brain in patients with suspected MS or ADEM. Clinical picture and neuroimaging should at least put you on the right track. But in the cases of inflammatory, infectious, and neoplastic pathologies, you need to sample CSF. First, we evaluate the opening pressure. Elevated opening pressure can be seen on fungal infections like cryptococcus and some neoplastic pathologies. Next, elevated protein usually means there's damage, but it's nonspecific and doesn't help you identify a particular disease. Low glucose means that glucose is being used up and usually by a hungry bug. Hypoglycorrhachia the $10 word for low glucose is usually seen in bacterial, some fungal infections, and neurosarcoidosis. CSF pleocytosis also helps. Very elevated neutrophils may suggest bacterial infection, but high lymphocytes can mean fungal, immune, or neoplastic pathologies. 
oligoclonal bands, the byproduct of myelin breakdown, and IgG index are suggestive of inflammatory pathology. Gram stain in cultures can help you isolate a particular infectious organism, as will pathogen specific antibodies like Lyme, and polymerase chain reactions or PCRs for varicella zoster, Epstein Barr, cytomegalovirus, enterovirus, and mycobacterium tuberculosis. Cytology and flow cytometry look for neoplastic cells. And rarely, when you suspect an inappropriate immune response to a tumor, you should check perineoplastic antibodies. When it comes to serology, the highest yield non-infectious serological test is aquaporin-4 IgG to help with the diagnosis of neuromyelitis optica. This antibody is the Sherlock Holmes of diagnostic tools for myelopathy. We briefly discussed that with immune-mediated pathologies, the damage can be restricted to CNS or affect the entire body. So autoimmune serologies can help you identify systemic disease. We are talking about tests like erythrocyte sedimentation ratio, ESR, C-reactive protein, CRP, anti-nuclear antibodies, ANA, anti-neutrophil antibodies, ANCA, thyroid antibodies, double-stranded DNA antibodies, Sjogren's antibodies, SSA and SSB, etc. Just like in CSF, blood serologies are really helpful for infectious pathology. To highlight a few, think of HIV, HTLV1, that's human T-cell lymphotrophic virus, syphilis, Lyme, and varicella zoster. When toxic metabolic pathologies got you down, measure vitamin B12, copper, and zinc levels. When you have an unexplained spinal cord stroke in a young patient, it's time to look for a hypercoagulable state. And finally, when all else fails and you still have no idea what's going on, perineoplastic panel to the rescue. It seems like a new perineoplastic antibody is being discovered daily, so there's no sense in listing them all here. When faced with such a patient, both you and I would have to crack open a PubMed search for that one. Just remember, if you do find perineoplastic antibodies, don't forget to look for cancer. There's a reason why these are called perineoplastic. Neoplasm is just around the corner. Some disorders can affect the peripheral nervous system in addition to the spinal cord, so nerve conduction studies can sometimes be helpful in confirming peripheral nerve involvement. But at the end of it all, the gold standard for diagnosis is of course tissue biopsy. But as you can imagine, the spinal cord does not take kindly to donating a piece of itself for scientific study. The yield is low, and the risk of neurological deficit is high, so biopsies are usually reserved for deteriorating patients where the cause of myelopathy is unknown despite all the extensive non-invasive workup. If there is a lesion outside the CNS, like in the case of some cancers, you should biopsy that before you go to the CNS. I'm guessing you're thinking two things at this point. Number one, my brain is about to explode from all this information overload. And two, myelopathy workup seems like throwing everything in the kitchen sink at your patient. Seems like a lot of work. And in the end, is the workup worth it? Or are we just going to arrive at some diagnosis that has no treatment? Well, if you subject patients with myelitis of a known cause to this workup, you'll get the diagnosis in over two-thirds which actually translates into a meaningful treatment change in a quarter. So the moral of the story is don't give up when the going gets tough. Remember the differential for our patient? Multiple sclerosis, neuromyelitis optica, acute spinal cord infarction, and syringomyelia. What diagnostic testing would you like to do? So MRI showed a longitudinally extensive central cord lesion. Aquaporin-4 IgG antibody is positive, and there's elevated CSF protein with one oligoclonal band. So the final diagnosis in this case is likely neuromyelitis optica. You surprised? Now the patient asks you about treatment options, and that brings us to the last section of the talk, review of treatments. Who are you? Why aren't you masked? Who are these people? I don't know. What the hell is that? What are you doing? 
tiring of the metal meningeal artery? How do you explain slow impulse, low respiratory rate, and coma? Fundoscopic examination. Fundoscopic is examination is unrevealing in these cases. A simple evacuation of the expanding epidural hematoma will relieve the pressure. My God, man. Drilling holes in his head's not the answer. The artery must be repaired. Now put away your butcher knives and let me save this patient before it's too late. We're dealing with medievalism here. Chemotherapy. Fundoscopic examinations. He's coming around, Jim. Pavel, talk to me. Name, rank. Chekhov. Pavel. Rank. Admiral. Treatments are generally geared towards the actual cause of myelopathy. So, for immune-mediated pathologies, we're usually starting with steroids, like methylprednisolone, plasma exchange or IVIG, 5-7 to seven treatments, and then we move on to steroid-sparing agents like azathioprine, methotrexate, mycophenolate mofetil, chemotherapy with cyclophosphamide, and a B-cell depleting agent like rituximab. For infectious causes, well, we have a whole slew of drugs. Antibacterials, we're talking third or fourth generation cephalosporin, vancomycin, doxycycline. Anti-tubercular drugs, like the intensive four-drug regimen of rifampin, isoniazid, pyranizamide, and ethambutol. Antifungals, like fluconazole, voriconazole, amphoterable, I mean amphotericin B, and flucytosine. Antiparasitic, like praziquantel, pyrimethamine, sulfadiazine. Antivirals, like acyclovir, gancyclovir, foscarnet. Antiretrovirals. And immunotherapies for post-infectious autoimmune-mediated process. For vascular causes, it's mostly supportive care for stroke. If there is a vascular malformation, it can be embolized and shut down. And for epidural hematomas, evacuation and decompression. Remember epidural hematomas? For structural cord compression, the first line of treatment is conservative. Soft collar, NSAIDs for pain, gabapentin, pregabalin, nortriptyline, and duloxetine for neuropathic pain, muscle relaxants, physical therapy, and when patients develop neurological deficits or have intractable pain, we move on to surgical management and decompression. For neoplastic pathologies, our options are steroids to decrease spinal cord edema, Surgical management, decompression, reconstruction of the spinal column, radiation, like stereotactic radiotherapy, and chemotherapy, especially for leptomeningeal spread. For toxic metabolic disorders, it's removal of the offending toxin or replacement of the deficiencies. And finally, for hereditary causes, largely it's supportive care, but gene therapy is showing some promise in certain disorders. So our patient was treated acutely with steroids and plasmapheresis. She eventually transitioned to chronic therapy with rituximab. She unfortunately developed spasticity, neuropathic pain, and urinary difficulties, and was treated with muscle relaxants and pregabalin. Now she walks with a cane and otherwise able to take care of her own activities of daily living. Congratulations! You made it to the end of this talk without your brain exploding! That's awesome! So to summarize, let's review the 10% of this talk that you do need to know. This is my favorite part of this whole PowerPoint, algorithm time. First, you suspect spinal cord dysfunction in a patient with progressive back pain, sensory level, weakness of lower or all extremities, unsteady gait, and bowel bladder dysfunction. Presumably that ABCs are stable, the next step would be to perform a rapid neurological eval. What are you looking for? Well, those spinal cord syndrome we discussed. Transverse pattern, where a patient loses all faculties below the level of the lesion. Hemicord pattern, where weakness and vibration proprioception loss is ipsilateral, and pain and temperature loss is contralateral. Anterior cord pattern, where all is lost but vibration and proprioception. 
central chord pattern, where sensory dissociation is prominent and sacrum is spared until the end, and posterior, or often posterior lateral syndrome, where dorsal columns and corticospinal tract can be affected. Next, is it an emergency? Meaning, are we dealing with a presentation within the first 48 hours of symptom onset? Yes? Then consider steroids to decrease cord edema and get a stat MRI of total spine without contrast to look for cord compression. If symptoms have been going on for a while, chances are you will have some time to perform diagnostic tests. Here, MRI of the spine without and with contrast is probably the best. If cord compression is present, then you're typically dealing with either structural, neoplastic, or infectious etiologies. Think of herniating disc, extradural met, or abscess. The next step is to immobilize the patient and consider urgent surgical decompression. If you're dealing with a known tumor, radiation therapy can be useful in cases where surgery is not appropriate. If it's a new diagnosis of malignancy, then a workup for primary neoplasm is in order, and we usually call our oncology colleagues for help. Now, if cord compression is absent, the next step is lumbar puncture. As you can imagine, lumbar puncture is a relatively difficult test to get and usually uncomfortable for the patient. So when we do draw CSF, we send a laundry list of tests, including glucose, protein, and cell counts, usually in tubes 1 and 4, gram stain, acid fast bacilli, fungal viral bacterial cultures, Lyme, VDRL, cytology, and flow cytometry. And we also always save extra CSF in case we need to test for zebra diagnoses. So why do we do a lumbar puncture? Well, to look for evidence of CNS inflammation, of course. If CNS inflammation is absent, consider repeating the lumbar puncture in a week because it might be too early in the disease course. If there's truly no CSF inflammation, then you're dealing with vascular and toxic metabolic pathologies. Think cord stroke and combined subacute degeneration. Remember that strokes cause anterior cord syndrome, they are rapidly progressive, and are usually caused by aortic surgery, emboli, or thrombophilia. So these patients need DWI MRI, or sometimes even more invasive spinal angiograms when we're dealing with an AVM. With respect to toxic metabolic, remember, ask about exposure and malabsorption, and look for cognitive and peripheral nervous system involvement. These patients should get vitamin B12, copper, zinc, and folate levels checked. Now, let's say CNS inflammation is present. High protein, CSF, IgG synthesis, white cells. Then you're dealing with immune-mediated or infectious pathologies. How do you suspect infection? Well, fevers, host factors predisposing to certain infections, and additional meningitis encephalitis. You would need to send a slew of CSF labs to isolate the actual infectious organism. How do you suspect when something is immune-mediated? Well, history of previous attacks, Lermitz and Utov phenomenon, and systemic symptoms. The next order of business is to define the extent of CSF inflammation. So, check NMO antibody and get an MRI of the brain and orbits, with and without contrast. If systemic inflammation is suspected, then we need to check for the usual suspects, lupus, Sjogren's, vasculitis, sarcoidosis, etc. And finally, when you're still stuck with the diagnosis, consider perineoplastic and hereditary pathologies. That's it. Thank you. I hope this helped. And as always, please contact me with any questions. Dr. Ribbonick, passing out.